All right. Uh, let me just open that up. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the February 22nd meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. Um, first item of the, on the agenda is comments from the chair. Um, usually, I just go through kind of what the plan for the meeting is. We have no formal hearings for this meeting, which is probably the first time in like at least the last four years that I can remember that. <laughs> so hopefully we can be efficient. We do have like some significant but well-constrained other business items. Um, so I think if we stay focused, we can get through this pretty quickly tonight. I also wanted to say thank you to Fletcher for pinch hitting and chairing in the last meeting. Um, I was in no shape to run a meeting. <laughs> So I really appreciate it. Yep, no problem. Um, and it sounds like you guys got through a lot, which is awesome. Thank you. Um, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Dave, did you have anything you wanted to update us on? Sure, just a couple of quick updates. Um, let's see, I was appreciative of uh, Brad and Tyler for giving their presentation at the last meeting. I thought that was a nice summary of, of work out there in the field in 2022. Um, you know, as always, there's there's more to do with with all the trails and trailheads and parking areas and and whatnot. Um, we are, <clears throat> given that uh, this is kind of the winter, well, with the exception of maybe tonight and some of the cold cold streak we had, a, you know, a month ago or so, kind of the winter winter that wasn't. So it has afforded us the opportunity to to still be out in the field. They are still doing some um, uh, brush hogging of, of uh, field habitat when they can. Um, Aaron, Brad, and Tyler are also have been meeting, and I think I'm going to meet with them. I think next week or the week after to really kind of focus in on you know what projects do we want to bring before the commission for 2023. You know, and and these would fall in the same categories, right? We we know you know we have lots of deferred maintenance out there. Uh, trails, bridges. We know that DEP, um, um, their interpretation of of existing bridges um, um, can be can challenge us at times with regard to uh, 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 delineations and whatnot. So, you know, Aaron has been a great kind of steward of helping us navigate um, uh, through those and what what projects need to come before the commission for permitting and, and what are in upland areas. So I think she'll be um, you know, giving me advice and giving Brad and Tyler advice as we look at 23 projects. Um, again, with that kind of focus on let's let's do the best we can to fix what we already have and, and uh, not expand uh, too, too much. Um, let's see, I, Aaron may wanna give you a quick update on Hickory Ridge. Um, with regard to next steps there, and I will leave that to her. I believe the bridge crossing over the Fort River is kind of the next step, so I'm going to leave that to Aaron. Um, I know that Aaron and I need to connect on the land use policy. I think that is coming back before you probably at your next meeting if, if you have a, a room on your next agenda, so that's exciting. As you recall, um, we all agreed, I think, that we were going to kick off this small working group to begin to kind of um, chip away at some of the the older policy, um, um, the older policy uh, documents we have, and 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 summarize all of those, and also look at kind of land use policy moving forward. So I'm excited about that in 23. Let's see. Um, um, you. We may be hearing, speaking of land use policy, we may be hearing from some of the folks who care deeply about Mount Pollux. I think uh, just to give you a heads up there, there's a there's a core group of folks who I've been talking with for a couple of years now about Mount Pollux. They would, they like many other people in town would love to see improvements to Mount Pollux, um, you know, uh, done, i.e. parking and, kiosks and 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 trail improvements, et cetera. And again, it's all within within reason, but but also we have to work within existing budgets and whatnot. So um, they're they are um, most interested in kind of a land use plan for Mount Pollux. And again, I think this will be part of the subcommittee that you all created 
I can't for the life of me tonight think of who was on it. I, I think Michelle volunteered for that group. Who else volunteered for that? Cameron and Alex. Oh, and Alex. Okay, great. <laughs> so we'll we'll get together, you know, in the coming weeks and start focusing on that. We do have some of those plans drafted, those management plans for various areas. And I think we want to have the bigger conversation about, you know, what what habitat are we keeping in like early successional. Um, um, habitat, if you will, what areas might we let go and, and uh, let nature take its course. But I think there's there's always great interest in Mount Pollock's, one of our most popular conservation areas. Um, the only other thing I would mention is that Aaron and I are focused on the uh, park grant that we got for Hickory Ridge. This is the accessible trail that uh, we are planning for the western portion, the southwestern portion of the property, and um, Aaron has been working diligently on that, and there will be a notice of intent coming before you, you know, as soon as, as, soon as possible, uh, as soon as Aaron can, can he got more time to get that uh, through uh, to you, um, but that should be an exciting project. Um, we are going to hire a designer to help us with that. And we, of course, would contract out for that construction. Um, and that'll be a loop trail, which I think you've seen the informal layout of. But um, Aaron and I will be talking to you about it at uh, that in more detail at, at the That upcoming. doesn't have like a fiscal year timeline on it, does it? Uh, yeah, we are. The park grant, uh, we have to have finished by uh, June, probably about June 1 of 24. Okay, not of this. Calendar okay. year 24. Got it. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Um, so that's bringing together CPA dollars and also um, the park grant funding. It's, I think, about two hundred and eighty thousand uh, in funding. So lots of things, as always, to to get done and move forward, and just trying to fit it all in with with um, the staff time that we have. I will say that um, you know the the planning department, who often collaborates with us, we we lost two staff members recently to other positions, Ben Brager and uh, Maureen Pollock. And Ben was working very closely with, with Aaron and myself on Hickory Ridge. So um, we lost a, a little a little bandwidth there, uh, but uh, we're doing the best we can to keep that project um, on track. So, um, so yeah, um, I was out at Hickory uh, Monday and took a walk around, um, looked at um, uh, some of the work that has been done north of, of the river and also uh, uh, looked at our proposed uh, uh, path for the new accessible trail. So, so anyway, I think I will stop there. I'm happy to take any questions, um, kind of a I broad have a overview. quick yeah. Hickory Ridge question. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Um, have they replaced the decking on the bridge that they're gonna use to access the north side of the river yet? I'm just tracking the, the condition of those bridges. No, in fact, that's okay. what Aaron can tell us a little bit more about that. Okay. Site okay. That the kickoff meeting was scheduled last week, and okay. due to some some unforeseen circumstances, um, that meeting was postponed. But that is upcoming, and Aaron can tell you more about that. Okay. Just keep in mind uh, for for all of the commission and anyone on this call, uh, any attendees, the only bridge that is going to be used for solar is that bridge on the eastern end of Hickory Ridge. None of the other bridges are approved for crossing. So vehicles of any kind cannot cross any of the other bridges. Those are only for pedestrians, yep. um, for, for hikers, if you will. Uh, and we're actually, as part of our work on the notices of intent, we're kind of assessing those bridges. There's already been an engineering uh, assessment done by the solar company, so we have that. Um, but we're actually taking a look at that and saying how many bridges can we, how many bridges should we maintain over time? Uh, there are five bridges over the Fort River and two over the Hop Brook, oh, excuse me, Plum Brook. Um, so whether we keep all of those or not is a question we're, we're kind of looking at right now. Okay, so, thank you, great. So thanks very much. Commissioners, any follow-up questions for Dave? Jumped in there quickly, seeing no's. Okay, thanks Dave. Aaron, do you want to move to minutes or do you want to give us a Hickory Ridge update? What um, order works best? Yeah, I'll just, as long as we're talking about Hickory Ridge, I'll just tell you, um, <clears throat> I 
re was reviewing some of the materials they there is a, a safety plan that they had um, that AMP had submitted to us. Um, gosh, it was probably three or four months ago, um, which had some outdated information. So I asked them to update that. Um, and also we are rescheduling sort of the um, what I'll call phase one, which is like the West Pomeroy to the bridge. Um, there's going to be multi multi um, pre construction meetings. So we already had the one pre construction for the tree removal. We're going to have another pre construction for the access road from West Pomeroy to the bridge. And then <clears throat> from there, um, a series of pre construction meetings based on I'm going to basically have them phase it out. Um, the access road from the bridge to the first crossing, the crossings themselves, because there's two two culverts going in and the access road between the culverts. And then there's an access road from the second culvert to the Western array. I'm not sure what their plan is as far as array construction, if they're planning on doing that in a phased way, but I'm trying to phase it out as much as possible just to keep the lines of communication open so that I can really keep sort of a tight handle on exactly what's being done by who and where. Um, so that's kind of where that stands the meeting there was a meeting scheduled on monday which unfortunately had to be canceled and i've been playing phone tag with um <clears throat> jamie from dynamic um but i'll be touching base with her tomorrow and rescheduling that meeting and i'll keep you guys posted on what's going on awesome thanks for keeping such close track with that aaron yeah aaron that sounds like a lot a lot of work Is there anything like else we can do to help like that's some I mean, I'm not going to show up at the meeting, but you know, yeah. like, like no. that's a, you, this is a lot of, this is a lot for one project. So I'm just, just let us know. Yeah. I mean, as soon as ground breaks, they're going to be having a, a monitor out there. Right. And um, as I do with all monitors, I kind of do spot checking as well as I know there's a lot of folks who walk out there. So I think we're going to have a lot of eyes on the ground and, um, you know, we'll just take it one day at a time and, um, I'll keep you guys informed, you know, as things go along and of the challenges, if anything comes up. Great. Alex, I see you have a question. Go ahead. Oh, can't hear you. I think you're muted. You're still muted. Hmm. Try. Um, I'm going to just try leaving the call and joining again. Yeah, because it shows your mute is turned off and it's still yeah. not letting you talk. Yeah, it's got to be something with your audio. Hmm. Uh, I got a timeout. Yeah. We're giving up. We're slicing Alex's neck. Hey, Jim. Alex, we will come back to this um, if you're able to rejoin with audio. Okay. Uh, and, um, and one more, could I just add one more quick update? Sure. Um, I see that Beth Wilson and Jason and Guilford are on the call, but I just wanted to give the commission a heads up. Um, um, thanks in large part to Beth, Jason, Aaron, and others. The town did sub submit a grant, and I'm not going to get the name of the grant off the top of my head, but I'm sure Beth can, can tell us about it or Aaron will remember. But it was a federal grant that we submitted recently for, for culvert, culvert replacement and um, fish passage and um, um, stream continuity and, and all these, these great uh, potential outcomes for some underperforming culverts on Hot Wine Lane and uh, West Pomeroy Lane. Awesome. So kudos to Beth. Beth really coordinated it. Um, she pulled it all together with with Aaron and Jason's help and budgets. And um, DPW had done a lot of the prep work, pre work, on kind of designing uh, culverts. If you know those culverts on um, Hot Wine Lane, they they flood. They're partially crushed, they're they're just not carrying the volume that they should. We I believe that road has been blocked at some times due to high water flow and et cetera. So uh, they were able to get uh, some of the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service to partner and and um, uh, Fort River Watershed Association and some others. So 
we'll keep our fingers crossed. I, I don't know the timeline. It's probably months out, but um, really, it could be a really cool grant if we get it. So that's I'm great. Close. I know Beth has everybody. Been, yeah. Yeah. Beth has been chasing dollars to do that culvert replacement since for at least four years, five years, maybe. So I mean, yeah. I'll ask her about it, but yeah, that's it's, great. It, it could be a great grant and kudos to everybody who. Who, uh, who is the Fed this? like funder? Is it? Uh, Aaron, could you? I think it's like highway DOT. DOT. Yeah. 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 Okay. That makes sense. All right. That's great. Thanks for adding that, Dave. I'm, I hope that my fingers and toes are crossed. Um, okay. Aaron, anything else you wanted to go over? Or should we roll through some minutes here? Yeah. Let's jump in. Minutes. All right, team. Basically, we need motions to approve each of these minutes and then a voice vote. Yeah, I think I'm I'm okay to do that if if everyone if anybody in the yeah. concom wants to uh, jump in, but I'm willing to. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes from February eighth, twenty twenty three, January eighteenth, twenty twenty three, January eleventh, twenty twenty three, January twenty fifth. 2023 and December 21, 2022. So we're looking for a second. Second. Second from Andre. Voice vote, Andre. Aye. Cameron. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. And I'm an aye. So that's just a quorum with Alex working on his audio. Hopefully that's okay. I'm sure that's okay. Um, okay. And then the other issue on our only other formal agenda item is um, a request to put a geocache at Zala. Um, Aaron, do you want to give us any background? I didn't see any concerns with this. Yeah, um, there is a gentleman in town who would like to put a geocache at the Catherine Cole Conservation Area. Oh, cool. um, I mean, I won't go into what geocaching is unless anybody wants me to but basically they leave a hidden container with coordinates um, and people try to find try to locate the container um, and open it up and uh, um, they want to hide it near the parking lot um, in a soda soda bottle style container um, and yeah it would basically be there for folks to kind of as like a scavenger hunt type activity to try to locate it. It's very common on conservation lands. Uh, I've seen them on conservation lands all over the state. I appreciate the notification. I don't see any concerns with this. Commissioners, any questions or concerns? No okay. concerns at all. Okay. So I well, think we just need... and, uh, hibernated in that parking lot like before the new the new one was put in right there it's right behind and really i shouldn't say that it was really close to the river. really really yeah. close to the parking lot yeah like four years ago it was like no right kidding there. oh wow that's awesome it's like literally yeah. in a mulch pile it was the bear was in the mulch pile you know, i was like parking parking next to it and somebody that like, well i know the guy that collared it and he's like there's a bear right there I'm like, what? anyway that's awesome. Okay. Be careful when you put the geocache near the parking lot. There could be a bear. It's <laughs> all we're saying. Do they, is, is it actually buried or not? The, the, the soda bottle with the coordinates and all that in it or no? Um, I think they, they were suggesting hanging it from a tree. I've seen them Branch like, of a tree. in little nooks or, uh, you yeah. know, in a, in a tree that's got a bit of a breaking it or i've seen them uh behind stuff under rock uh okay. lots of different so my only but my only thought is you know i mean sometimes like somebody might just think up. that's trash and pick it up and throw it away or recycle it so i guess that's the risk you take right? yeah i think they probably have a system for this um okay then commissioners yeah, I think a motion to approve the request to put a geocache at Catherine Cole. This uh -oh. is what it looks like. This is the <clears throat> geocache. It looks like the sort of a oh. cylindrical bottle that they put the object in. 
So it's not, it doesn't look like a piece of garbage, <laughs> luckily. Okay, Alex, did you have a question about the geocache? No, because can okay. you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank okay. you. Good. Um, and we'll come right back to you asking any questions, but let's just, we need a motion to approve this Great. application, this land use application. Right. Uh, I motion to approve the application for a geocache uh, place at the Clark um, Trails. Is that what it is? Catherine, Catherine Cole. 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 Cole Trails. Seconded. Seconded from Cameron. Voice vote. Alex. Aye. Andre. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Cameron. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay, Alex, did you have a question about Hickory Ridge or something in Dave's report? I just wanted to ask you if there had been much public comment or um, Dave had talked about a lot of people using the area and would be curious if it was, did you get a lot of um, attention? Uh, with public? regard to the tree cutting? Just generally speaking, you were asking them to put up signs about what was going on and you were concerned that there would be a lot of inquiries, were there? Um, I would say there were a handful of inquiries by email or phone. Um, I answered most of them. We are, uh, our office still plans to put up signs near the clubhouse, which is kind of the main trailhead, if you will. Um, I think we'll be doing an update online on the town website. Uh, with our communications director, probably I would think it'd be next week. Um, so yeah, we're trying to do updates as as work is either done or anticipated. But I, I think the main thing was, you know, obviously it was, you know, somewhat shocking to people to see the trees come down. I, I, I will say that almost to a person, and, and again, I was out there a little bit this weekend and encountered a couple of people and when they actually, many of the people who inquired didn't know about the solar component of the project. So when they find out what the, the plan is and what the plan has been, then they seem to, to, to just have a better you know, understanding and, and more kind of just a broader perspective on the project. I do remind them that, you know, honestly, without the, you know, the town entered into the this, the purchase of the pro, uh, property with solar already predetermined. So there was no there was no option for the town to opt out of 26 acres of solar. And I think, um, again, I don't think it's anyone's fault, but I think it's been such a long process that that has been lost on some folks. So they think the town has chosen to move forward with 26 acres. I'm not saying the 26 acres of solar is a bad thing on that site. I'm just saying many people have asked me in emails and phone calls, why do, why do we, the town, have to do that? And I think the short answer is that's the project we bought. We bought the land with solar predetermined on the site. So um, we bought it for 520,000 and the, the, the fair market value would have been 2 million. And yeah, thanks, Dave. That's yeah. That's more than I bargained for. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um. So next, let's see. We have a lot of other business. Um. And I think Aaron's got it in the right the right order here, kind of based on the people we have present. So I think our next item will be um about the violation at five hundred five West Street and the possibility of. Working through a, a bundled NOI with the DPW, the Amherst DPW. Um, so I see Beth, Guilford, Jason, and Paul in the call. If you guys, I'm assuming I'm going to bring you guys in. If anyone else um, who's representing the DPW for this conversation wants to come in, if you could just raise your hand. Right. Sorry, this always takes longer than I want it to. All right. Oh, I see Beth. Um, hi. And Guilford. Hello. It was um, just the four of us. We didn't bring our lawyer to this. <laughs> <laughs> Us either, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Um, all right. Well, I think that's everyone. Hi, Jason. Hi. Thanks, guys, for making the time for this. I know this is far after hours for you, um, but I'm hoping this can kind of be a productive conversation that can end someplace that we're all happy about moving forward. Um, so the first issue is the uh, culvert kind of reclamation at 505 West Street. Is there any way that we could kind of button up or that you guys would be willing to um, kind of button up that site so that we can protect the wetland there from further erosion concerns? I think that's just the first most important issue because that is a violation and it is our job to uphold the Wetland Protection Act and the bylaws. Um, so I think that's issue A. Um, um, I'm just a little confused. How, how would you like us to button it up? I mean, it's, it's completely underwater. We didn't even daylight it to the stream. So it's back charging the pipe still. Uh, we put the hay bales downstream from the outfall. And I mean, we could float some straw on the puddle, but I'm not sure what that would do. Okay. And do there's you think like maybe six inches of exposed soil on each side. Okay. Do you think there's any value in doing some like waddle or any kind of matting to protect those six inches of exposed soil to prevent that from just being a source of sediment into the stream? Is there any way to I further protect that? I don't think that? the waddle would really do much more than what the straw bales, hay bales are doing. Downstream. Um, we could spread some straw on those little edges because matting, you can't get matting to, to sink inside of a, of a, of underwater. So yeah. it's just be more like throwing a fish net over it. Yeah. Um, not sure. Yeah, so there's mostly standing water. We barely exposed the pipe. Um, so I don't know, and we didn't want to go any further because we knew we were getting close to the river. We just wanted the pipe to be able to actually flow out. So more or less, we kind of created like a sediment floor bay. Right, right. Um, yeah. Now the pipe can actually flow freely. Well, somewhat freely. It's still back, it's still surcharged. Yeah, um, gotcha. There's still back water there. Yeah. Um, and the, okay. the, the soil that's exposed is like vertical. Right. So yeah. sort of gluing something to it. I'm not like hydro seed comes yeah, to that's... mind. We don't have a hydro seeder. Yeah. Right. No, no, no. Um, no, not this time of year. Yeah. And seeding uh, this time of year. Is... Yeah. Yeah. My concern know, from our bank, standpoint, the upper yeah. bank closer to the parking lot on the lower half of the picture, that we could probably put some matting to and use some staples. Because that's less staples. of a slope. Yeah. yeah. The vertical part, I mean, we just tried to do as minimal disturbance as possible and expose the pipe. Yeah. Gotcha. Get yeah. Some water to flow out of it. Yeah. I 100% appreciate that you guys are just trying to keep this pipe flowing. I like understand that's 100%. I've seen this. I, I like know that you guys are just trying to keep this working. Um, and I 100% appreciate that the, you know, we just have to be consistent in how we deal with these situations. And that's why I'm just asking for some creative thinking. I think Jason, if you would be willing to do any kind of stabilization in the slope on the lower part of this image, that would be great. That that's what you're suggesting, right? Because it's less of like a vertical. Right, it's slope. not vertical at least. And I guess across the way, there's some that looks like they spilled over a little bit too. So yeah, yeah. Um, commission. I mean, does anyone? Oh, sorry, but, Jason. Go ahead. I was just saying, like, I mean, we even like to expose the head wall more, but we kind of just stopped because we were, you know, we knew we just we we found the pipe, and once we did, we just wanted to at least relieve some of the stormwater out of it. Totally. Yep. I gotcha. Um, I think that would be a good approach for moving forward. Commissioners, does anyone have any other ideas for kind of um, protecting this site from sediment and erosion or erosion of sediment? Um, just give like a quick background. So um, this pipe is, was buried. Is that correct? So you guys are just yes. opening up to try to get water to flow through. Correct. And we did ask permission of you a couple of years ago 
put together a small list, a small narrative, uh, and sent some emails back and forth between Aaron and us. And um, you know, we we thought we had permission. We had that small list of I forget it, it was ten or twelve outfalls, um, and we just took too long to get around to it, unfortunately. So two years later, we went and did it, and it was much more than we expected. Honestly, we didn't think it was buried that deep. We knew there was a pipe there, but um, you know, until you go there, there's no real great way to determine where everything is without doing some exploratory digging. Yep. So that so, water there is from water coming through the pipe. It's not like groundwater coming up or something. Or correct. That's stormwater coming out of the stormwater treatment system. Yep. Cool. And so that's. I'm sorry. I haven't actually seen the. I haven't seen this on. I just seen the uh, photos. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm looking at. Is like six eight inches deep. No, probably closer to a foot to a foot and a half, maybe yep. even two, honestly. Yeah. Is it's that like the pipe right feet? there on the left, barely? Yeah, I think that's yeah. about a 12 inch pipe. I'm not even sure. We couldn't even really measure it. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah. It was, does it, what does it look like on the other side? It's not a culvert, it's a stormwater outfall. So it oh, comes from sorry. A, so, yeah, the, the letter called it a culvert, but that's all right. It's, it's just a stormwater outfall. It takes stormwater from uh, up this hill. Uh, from about Pomeroy Lane down to this location. Gotcha. There's maybe four or six catch basins and a couple of drain manholes. Okay. And I wouldn't, and I wouldn't say it's, you know, flowing, flowing heavily either. You know, it's no. sort of this basin sort of filled when we first emptied it, and then it's just been sort of sitting there. Um, you know, I think one reason that it ended up getting so buried is that it, it just, it doesn't carry a lot of water. It never created a flooding problem. So we weren't in there, you know, right. maintaining it because it didn't create any kind of a flooding problem. That was my yeah. next question. Like where, yeah. where I was like, where? Well, there was some weird from. ponding on the sidewalk above. And I don't know if that's been solved yet or not. The spring it might, spring might show us that. We, we were we've been chasing water leaks over there for a while and thinking that it was a water main leak. And there was mm. always a puddle in the sidewalk. And, and I think, I don't know, it might've had something to do with the backed up culvert, but it was never anything that impeded traffic. It might've made, pedest it impeded pedestrian traffic, mm. um, but never really out in the, didn't really cause any issues in the road. Yeah. And so you guys so, dug this out and then you throw down the, the straw over there. Yeah, for just the outfall channel. Yep. But anything that does head down towards the brook is just another, I don't know, five or 10 feet away. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill in terms of like this particular site. Um, I think, you know, you guys clearly this was necessary maintenance. I know exactly the spot. You know, I, hindsight being 2020 in letting Aaron know, but I understand that there was a, like there was an effort towards communication. So I don't think we need to rehash that. Just anything we can do anything you guys can do to kind of stabilize that lower slope in the picture, I think that would be a great progress in the right direction. And that way, if we get crazy rains this spring, we're not going to see that whole slope eroding into this sit ponding situation. <laughs> sure the bittersweet will take back over once, once the yeah. pops again. Unfortunately, it won't that be... whole hillside is all bittersweet. Yeah, it won't be a, as noticeable by the growing season, I'm sure. Um, okay, commissioners, does that seem, if, if Jason, if that's okay with you and Guilford and Paul and Beth, then that seems reasonable to me. Um, commissioners, does anyone have any questions or comments about that? Are we all okay with that? Aaron, can you stop sharing so I can see everyone's face? Sorry. Thank you for pulling up those photos. I'm not seeing, so, oh, we have so a question. Is just as far as I can uh, see from our conversations here is that this is something that uh, that's more of an exception that uh, happened uh, in essence due to a miscommunication and uh, in the future we would expect something different, no? Well, no, right now in the future you expect the same thing. We give you a list. Um, Aaron would run through and say what needs to be done. And if she says it's okay, we would schedule it. Um, hopefully in the future we act a little bit faster, but as you have the same problem we have with maintenance of your conservation area, sometimes we get drugged off and end up, <clears throat> things get end up being put off until later. 
Um, so unless you want to change us and how we do our maintenance, um, that's fine. But um, right now we're still under the impression that we'll co coordinate with Aaron the list of what we want to do. And we just need to be a little quicker on being true to what we say the data is, we'll do it, which is our shortcoming on this one, I believe. But if you want to do something different, let us know. Okay, um, yeah. let's come back to that point. Andre, did you have a follow-up? Because Yeah, I'm just, uh, I mean, so we're, uh, so how is it that, uh, that, that, that the culvert ended up uh, like this? Um, I, I mean, at the beginning of our conversation, we were, uh, it, it was mentioned that this is a violation. Is that correct? You're calling it a violation. We oh, think I'm it's not. maintenance. I'm, I'm, okay, so the uh, the commission's calling it a violation, right? So we're trying to avoid those. Yes. Where I'm going. We need to look yeah. at what we're defining as maintenance and what we're defining as significant disturbance. Yeah. And Thanks for saying that, Jason. I, I think mean, it is an existing stormwater utility, and there's an exemption built in for those. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I I want to move. Um, I think this is a great discussion. I just want to kind of finish the conversation about 505 West Street to make sure we're all cool on that. Um, let me let's let's put a pin in that. Alex, do you have a comment about the restoration of the um, stormwater infrastructure exposure at 505 West Street? Yes. Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. I was just curious to hear from Jason or Guilford or Beth, what will this look like when you've got it finished? Is it, is it, are you, is it done now? Or how would you see the final design? I think we can add a little bit of straw mulch and maybe some matting on it on a couple of the edges that aren't dead vertical. Um, there's nothing we can do it underwater unless we extend that channel to daylight it, which I don't think anybody wants. Um, so I think it will stay as a sediment floor bay. The vegetation will grow back there. I, I have ultimate confidence in that. It was full of roots. Um, it's, it was basically just a big mat of, of bittersweet roots and stems and and you know i'm sure there's other other species other other things growing in there too but i mean i'm sure it'll grow back this spring and it'll be as green as green as it was last year um just with the addition to the standing water there it'll basically be a sediment floor bay out of the out of the stormwater outfall thank you aaron did you have a comment about 505 the site at 505 West Street? Yeah, um, I do think that the exposed soil should be covered over in some fashion, not just at the outlet portion, but on the, the side slopes where there's exposed soils. Um, I understand that there's excessive um, invasives out there, um, but I do think that there is potential for a lot of sediment in that area and erosion in that area. And I think that um, if this type of work is going to be happening that sort of goes beyond annual maintenance, that there needs to be stabilization measures that we would require of anybody in town. Um, you know, I wouldn't allow anybody else to, you know, dig out an area like that and just leave it exposed if they were filing for a new permit they'd be doing some sort of stabilization on the the slopes and the outfall to make sure that um that that area is not just left completely exposed to the elements um from you know rain falling and right. eroding the soils into the into the basin because it's just going to happen again um the other the other sort of concern I have with this particular area is like, as Jason said, they, there is like a sediment for bay that's been created. And normally when you're designing a stormwater BMP like a sediment for bay, there's sort of a, a system in place that where it's designed to hold a certain capacity and then drain. And in this case, it's basically just created this pond here, which is just going to sit stagnant water and and not really function um properly and so i guess at, 
on some level, I think to myself, like, you know, if it's not functioning, it's backing up, it's clogging, and this is like a repeated problem that sort of a long-term solution would be a really good idea in terms of why isn't it draining? You know, should we come up with some sort of measure to make sure that it's properly draining? Like maybe a series of check dams that are um, stabilized with stone or um, erosion control blankets or something so that the water can actually phase out of that pond and and the turbidity can settle out of it um, and it's not just sitting there like a sort of a mosquito breeding area um, and you know year after year when it's maintained hopefully it's not dredged out and left just in an exposed manner um, so I mean those are just my general comments on it that if we were permitting something we would require stabilization and um, I think that the, the whole long-term maintenance discussion that, that Jason brought up is an important one. This isn't to say that maintenance isn't allowed or annual maintenance isn't allowed. We understand culvert inlets and outlets need to be, you know, cleaned out and catch basins need to be, you know, vacuumed out and, and the like. And we want to make sure that that annual maintenance is happening. But when there's a situation where it's like a an accumulation of material that goes beyond annual maintenance that we have a system in place to identify it and have it properly dealt with in a way that sort of meets the regulations because I feel like um, it's not always um, for example if it's pre-1996 um, and there's not an active order of conditions that mandates its operation and maintenance um, we may need to have additional detail in terms of how they're handling it. Okay. Um, so I see Guilford and Beth, I see you guys have your hands up. I want to really just come to a plan for 505 West Street. So is that about 505 West Street, Beth? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So with those comments, it seemed like we were getting there. So Jason, you agreed that on the in the images we saw on the closer bank where there's a little bit less of a vertical wall, we could put in some sort of, I don't, um, matting uh, to protect from erosion. What would it take to just pull back the vertical bank on the opposite side so that we can get some sort of matting over that? Um, would that be possible? Because the concern is just intense rilling if there's a big storm event and just filling that right back up. Um, Aaron is right. Like if we were permitting this, it would be like a whole thing. I don't think we need to do that here. Um, I just want to protect those banks because they're, they don't look super stable and it's very visible. Um, is that a possibility? So if going to require additional excavation like we're going to have to bring that back to like a at least a two to one slope so that something can lay right flat I, know. On it. I understand and, and then there's nothing we can do with the part that's completely submerged unless right. we take that channel another yeah. couple of few five or ten feet honestly if we wanted yeah. to daylight that channel get the water out of there we could fully stabilize that entire channel but right. if we just want to do the sides, we can slope those back instead of having vertical. You know, we can slope yeah. what we can reach with the excavator. We can slope back, um, and then and then we can put some matting down on it. Okay, Fletcher, I'm gonna call 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 on you. <laughs> um, in your tenure in the uh, concom, does this seem like a reasonable um, yeah. stabilization of the slope? Is there anything oh, that's else fine? Yeah, nimbly yeah. invasive that you think would be necessary here I think that's fine but um okay is that do you or do you guys think that's like solves the like that pooling water issue or is the basin just kind of is it clogged is it functioning the only way you can solve the ponding water is to oh. extend the channel long right you have to dig further right daylight it so that you you know till, till that starts to drain and then in order to see yeah okay it's only ponding because it's just it's wet yeah well, it's ponding because we didn't dig it all the way to the stream, basically. Right. Whereas, you know, we. I'm trying really to think of like a more of a long term solution here. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're kind of short term. I, mean, I think we're think short term worth, here. I think it's worth waiting till the spring, waiting for the wet season to come and go, and seeing if it just infiltrates out during the dry season. It might only be ponding because there's frozen ground. 
because it's very, you know, dense soil, it might actually kind of like open itself up with a few flushes. And we'll see in the, you know, see in the spring once the thaw comes, once the summer comes, if it's still ponding, we can go further and talk about an, any other solution, you know, potentially. So in the meantime, stabilize to stabilize kind it. of prevent further sedimentation. And then we monitor the situation. And if more, if you guys need to do more in order to have that function, then we can revisit this maybe in a more formal RDA kind of situation. Um, would that be okay? If we move forward like that. Okay, I'm getting getting nothing, but since nobody's raising their hand, I'm gonna we're gonna go with that. Um, Fletcher, you yeah, I mean, I yeah, I, I mean, I, I would like to see a longer term solution, but I think I think if you want to stabilize the situation right now, wait till obviously the spring comes and goes. I I agree. I understand why water would be probably pooling there right now. Yeah, um, I'm it's not, such I'm not disagreeing with that. That's totally understandable. Um, so if we can just stabilize the site as much as possible, it makes people happy. Go for okay. it um, for this particular situation. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks for working together on that, everyone. Um, so I think now the best thing would be to have a discussion about how we move forward to prevent us all having to do this every time there's something that is borderline between regular maintenance and something that should be fully permitted work. Um, our interest here is not to create work, it's to make sure we have clear guidelines that make such sit avoid situations like this in the future. Um, so one thing that Aaron has floated um, that we've done with UMass, actually Beth, you worked through with UMass is a bundled NOI. And what that does is just clearly kind of segment um, different levels of notification and um, kind of interaction between the town and UMass when they wanna do different activities in, jurisdiction, in jurisdictional areas, and then clearly delineates when an RDA or a permit is required. We actually have one of those discussions on the agenda after this tonight. Um, so that is, that is one thing that has moved forward. Um, and I was wondering, you know, I want to hear Beth and, and Guilford, your thoughts on base, based on kind of where Aaron was going with that. Um, but I also think that that would be just a really clear, solid way to delineate this moving forward. And I'd, I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on that. Um, Guilford, I think your hand was up before and I don't want to miss that um, comment. So if you want to go ahead, if you want to start, feel free. Otherwise, Beth. Beth is ready to start. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have a few thoughts on it. Um, one thing is just, I guess, the knowledge that the CONCOM sort of needs to know about all the work that DPW does in general. I mean, we have different divisions, you know, we have four different divisions and we do a lot of environmental work under each of the divisions. Um, and under the Wetlands Protection Act, there is that very broad exemption. That's kind of, I think, the first thing we need to look at if we're going to start talking about all this stuff. Um, that particular statement really, in my opinion, takes out anything having to do with um, water department, uh, sewer department. Um, that statement, and we can, I could bring that statement up, but I think at least Aaron knows what I'm talking about. Um, and we get, I think like, I don't know if we should get into all of this tonight, but it's sort of like maybe the first step would be to actually really look at what's exempt and look at what DPW does on a daily basis and sort of what's already exempt under that statement I'm talking about, but then also all the minor activities. There's a whole lot of, of parts of the Wetlands Protection Act and the town bylaw and regulations that exempt sort of various aspects to what GPW does. And I guess that would be my way of starting is like, okay, let's look at that first, you know? And like I said, I'm not quite prepared to do that tonight, but- Un um, Understood, yeah, I like that approach 100%. By no means are we suggesting that this needs to be a revamping of, you know, every DPW activity, you know, that, that you guys do. We understand that it's a lot and we understand that you have a lot of moving parts. It's more, we just want to make it clear when we're at and above the line for something that is like 
permitting and requires permitting. Um, but yeah. Beth, I think that's a great, that's a great approach. We had immediate hands up. I think Andre, I saw your hand first. Yeah, no, I'd be very interested in seeing that uh, uh, the wording for those exemptions, because otherwise I, you're, you're just talking about exemptions that I have no, no idea what they are. Yeah. I okay. could share something if we want to look at anything tonight, but we can also, you know, have a bigger discussion some other time. Yeah, and I I'm think not, I mean I'm not I'm in just, a hurry. Yeah, and I'm I'm cognizant. I mean, this doesn't have to be a huge rush. I'm cognizant that this is after hours for everyone. And I think it's something that could happen during business hours. Um, so I don't want to get into the weeds tonight. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's a great first ap approach, Beth. Aaron, did you have further thoughts on that? Yeah, I just wanted to say to Beth's point that I wasn't referring to um, things that fall under directly exempted under the Wetlands Protection Act, but stormwater isn't directly exempted. Um, you know, the utility exemptions for um, like, for example, Eversource or the sewer department, um, you know, those exemptions obviously that are in the care of public utilities that are listed specifically in the act, I completely agree wouldn't require um, to be wouldn't be required to be part of the, you know, an operation and maintenance order of conditions. What I'm talking about specifically is stormwater that's not referenced. Um, that was that's kind of where that comment centered from. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, Jason, I see you. And I think I see Alex has a comment too. I just want to quickly clarify. So Beth, when you when we did the bundled, I should remember this, but when we did the bundled NOI with UMass, I believe we started in a similar place where it was kind of like, here's giant categories of things. Let's figure out how to kind of allocate them in different levels of effort and communication. Mm -hmm. Again, with the goal of not wasting anyone's time and talking excessively about small, regular maintenance and more just making sure that we have good communication on things that aren't exempt. Um, so, I mean, yeah. yeah. And I, I think, you know, other bundle NOIs that I've seen are, are structured similarly. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. I'll, I think Jason, I saw Alex's hand. I'm just going to let him make a comment and come back. Alex, did you have a question or comment? Yeah. Following up on um, the bundling idea. Um, the Corps of Engineers has what they call a nationwide permit for, and there's several of them, and they address uh, certain kinds of activities. And if you fall within, if you have one of the activities that falls under a particular nationwide permit, then the conditions are already laid out and you don't have to go for a general, uh, you don't have to go for a specific permit. You just follow what's in the nationwide permit. So when you're talking about the bundling, I automatically started thinking, well, that system's already invented. And it sounds like Beth and and you have been working with UMass on a similar kind of thing. So there's, yeah. a, there's a model out there that you're kind of reinventing. Um, and I think that that's a wonderful idea. It would save a lot of time. And it would take some work to get it worked out, but once it's there, you just follow it. And it, it would cut down on a lot of need for um, the DPW coming before the CONCOM. Yeah, Alex, exactly. You're kind of translating into federal space what already exists in um, many, many towns around the state of Massachusetts and specifically already exists, already exists between us and UMass. Um, and just for background, Beth um, was our conservation agent before Aaron. And so when Fletcher and I were on the Conservation Commission, um, Beth helped navigate that process and get that in place with UMass. Um, so that's what we're referencing. Yeah, perfect. Exactly. You 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 bridged it perfectly. Um, Jason, did I'm sorry, this is taking a while to get to you. <laughs> I just want to reel back to the term sewer and see what our definition is here because historically there's been two sewer systems oftentimes combined. There's a storm sewer and a sanitary sewer. And the exemption applies to sewer. So mm. I just want to be clear on what sewer we're exempting or if it's all sewer. Um, 
because there's sanitary and there's storm sewer. Right. Um, so and I, I'm sure I, there's. I've always heard the two are both exempt. Interesting. Okay. I think that that's probably something we could look at other DPW and town kind of bundled NOIs. I'm sure Aaron has a technical opinion. I'm sure you do. It seems like something that we would work out in this like initial kind of conversation that Beth proposed. Um, but I hear you combine sewers. I get it. Same yeah. pipes, two different sources. I could see how that would be confusing. Guilford. And just to add to it, um, we're now permitted as a municipally separate stormwater system. Um, so we carry that permit from the federal government for our stormwater system, which includes these outfalls and collection systems. Right. And as we move through the MS4 process, we're making all of our maintenance and stuff that the the difference between us and all our local communities around us is we were exempt for the first permit, um, which we don't really understand how we were exempt, but there was a little faux pas and we were left out of the first permit. And now we're in the second permit and we're catching up and doing everything in the first permit and the second permit in the second permit period right now. So there is things we're doing to inventory and determine how much sediment is uh, being collected in different areas and then making our maintenance plan, which my my comment earlier was going to be yearly maintenance is not what you need to do all the time. Um, some of our maintenance may be um, on a five-year basis or a four-year basis based on the system we're, we're maintaining. Um, we have a couple of uh, storm scepters that really haven't had to be cleaned out yet. We've had some that have had been cleaned out. So some of our storm scepters have been in for over 10 years. Um, so those are the things we're supposed to be quantifying as we are categorizing and developing our stormwater system in accordance with the federal guidelines that are coming up, or actually we're in right now. So that's just another part of it too. There's a lot of things going on. It's kind of a yeah. nothing stands still. I appreciate how significant the MS4 requirements are um, and how much work that it is to kind of speed. And I think Beth, you even, was it last summer, gave us a presentation on the MS4 sampling program. Um, and I remember how complicated that was. So thanks Gil for, for taking the time to explain that and fill us in. Um, Aaron, I just wanted to respond to Jason's comment about sewer. And I definitely, that is a point well taken. I've clarified with DEP many times on that. They do not consider stormwater to be a part of that exemption. And the reason um, that they have incorporated um, in the Wetland Protection Act regulations for operation and maintenance plans, for example, and they have to be built into orders of conditions where there's ongoing conditions for maintenance over long periods of time is because that exemption doesn't fall on stormwater. So that's the read I've gotten from DEP on it. And I just wanted to share that. Okay, thanks, Erin. Um, Beth, I feel like you had a, maybe an MS4 comment or maybe other things. Um, yeah, kind of a combination. Um, you know, just throwing out some information about our stormwater system, we have over 380 outfalls. So we, we absolutely can't um, clean them out every single year. And we certainly do prioritize ones that um, typically flood, meaning they just tend to be an area that gets more, more water, or they just happen to be an area that gets, you know, sedimented in faster or leaves. Get... So there are certain ones we clean out much more constantly than other ones. And, and now that is all part of the MS4 work that we're doing right now, as Guilford mentioned, one part of it is a um, maintenance program for it, it includes more than just our stormwater system, but it's a, it's a document that we're working on that has to do with the uh, maintenance of a variety of things across town. Um, the DPW does even things like um, you know landscaping and use of pesticides and herbicides. So it's a document that really inventories facilities and and things, and then talks about DPW's best management practices. And part of that will be the stormwater system how it's maintained. Well, so maybe in order to prevent duplications of efforts with something moving towards a bundled NOI, that maintenance plan could roll into that informing a bundled NOI. And that way 
this process of weeding through everything the DPW does and figuring out how to kind of categorize it in NOI or in Wetlands Protection Act and town bylaw language, we could just instead start with everything you've already done for a maintenance inventory and move it that way. And that way the timeline, you know, we're not adding this on top of what clearly is a very full kind of workload. Um, instead, we could kind of time it so that we take advantage of the work you've done, will have already done on that and roll it into an NOI. Is that like at all conceivable? I think that sounds great. With yeah, that? <clears throat> I think that would be great. So is a path forward here just to kind of fill us in or fill Aaron in or fill Dave in or whoever the appropriate per point of contact is, is like kind of on the schedule of just when you think that maintenance plan will kind of be in a living, I'm sure it's a living document, but at least in a place where we could then kind of scoop it into the NOI world. Is that a good, just communicate about how that's going and then we pick up a bundled NOI effort once we have an understanding of how that looks. Is that a possible way forward here? I think I think that's a great um, way forward. You know, the, the timing on that document, I, I can keep people updated. It, it's, it's in process. It has a little bit to do with when we have interns to help with it, um, but it is, it's definitely started and moving along, I guess. I don't know, Guilford, do you feel all right with that sort of process? Yes, that's fine. I think it's a good thing to do. Okay. The other thing is, I mean, I know oh, Aaron has a comment and I don't want to volunteer, you know, I don't know. I wonder if two departments could have an intern together that could work through that. <laughs> um, that might be an idea uh, just to take some of the burden off of you guys to communicate with everything else you've got going on. Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to make sure that this situation um, on West Street doesn't detract from our overall sort of communication on those annual, biannual, et cetera, maintenance needs. And that, you know, we should keep those lines of communication open because this is by no means a intention of ceasing that maintenance or deferring that maintenance. What it is, is if there are situations that are really going beyond just maintenance that we can communicate on them in some manner. And if that means you guys, for example, need a, an emergency certification because it's flooding a roadway or it's causing flooding to residents or there's some kind of issue that is causing a public health or safety issue, please just let me know and we can issue an emergency certification and come up with some suggestions for how to stabilize it because our goal is to help you guys stay in compliance as much as possible to keep the lines of communication to work cooperatively together. So I just want you guys to know that I don't want this as we're working towards a bundled NOI and developing what that's going to look like. I don't want you guys to feel like you can't come to the commission with, you know, situations which are unique or challenging and say hey we have this challenging situation and Jason and I check in a lot on on those situations and so I would love to keep those lines of communication open to make sure that we can um you know work together on how to solve these problems great thanks Aaron so it seems like we have a path forward on kind of both fronts um Andre I see you have your hand up Go ahead. Yeah, just for my clarification, um, are, are Aaron, are you and Jason, are the two of you in um, agreement about the uh, stormwater versus uh, uh, versus um, the sewer water exemptions or uh, yeah, there's I, a little bit of something that needs to be hashed out there that uh, you guys need to uh, figure yeah. out? I agree that it sounds like that conversation needs to happen. I don't think that this is the place to do it. Um, well, I think I, that there's a lot of expertise there, but I'm cognizant of the time and what we have left to do on our agenda and also the time of everyone on the call. Andre, I'm not dismissing it. I think as Beth um, kind of, or whomever at CBW um, who's working on this maintenance plan, MS4 derived maintenance plan could 
keep Aaron in touch of the progress of that. I think eventually when that rolls into NOI language, we will have to clearly delineate whether a combined sewer uh, is fully jurisdictional to the Wetlands Protection Act or not. It sounds like the indication from DEP is that a storm system is not exempt, but we, we will have to handle that in a different forum. Um, but thank you, Andre. I agree that we can't lose sight of that. Um, well, but the, but we're, the reason why we're here is because of the fact that uh, there was there's a, a some a stormwater uh, drainage that uh, was uh, that had to be maintained, if you would, and that uh, there was an issue that that occurred from there. So that's the right. root of it. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're if working. you don't want to discuss it, that's fine. But but that's where it's coming from. So it's something that needs to be figured out. Can I make a suggestion just to get us through yeah. this impasse? Yeah, sure. Um, if it's okay with everyone, I would offer to draft a memorandum of understanding between the Conservation Commission and DPW, like a simple one page kind of outline of sort of what would be um, considered to be normal maintenance, what might be beyond the scope of that, and what would sort of require inquiry with the Conservation Commission, just so that we have something in writing and we can work together to craft that, modify that, and make sure everybody's happy with it going forward, just so that in the interim, while the bundled NOI is being developed, we sort of have like a protocol to follow. Um, and I'm not suggesting that we do that during the meeting, but like offline um, between staff and that we could present it to the CONCOM and say, this is kind of what we've come up with. Um, to address everybody's concern, but have a protocol in place in the interim. Guilford. I mean, Aaron's idea is fine. Um, I just want to make one statement because this is a public meeting and people may review this tape later. Um, Jason did talk about sanitary and storm drain sewers and some are combined. In the town of Amherst, there are no designed and permanently or purposefully installed combined sewers. Just so, just a little, just a little hashtag out there for the world. So we're not just people say, "Oh yeah, they said they were a combined sewer." We're not. Um, we're totally uh, separate. Sewers separate from stormwater. Appreciate that. Okay, thanks, Gilford. Um, I think, I think Jenny did a great job here trying to I think I think we have an understanding here with getting together the bundling that maintenance maintenance plan into some type of bundled NOI type of thing um uh yeah so I guess Aaron in a in an in this agreement and what counts as maintenance and what doesn't moving forward could you just start with kind of where you were with with the emails with Jason in 2021, because I thought that was like a pretty good starting point. I think the issue here is just passage of time, which frankly happens to all of us. Um, so I think just starting there, because we know that we were that everyone was comfortable with that, and um, just keeping open lines of communication. That way, we don't have to do do this again. As great as you guys are, um, every time one of these situations comes up, I think that would be great. Um, and Again, Jason and everyone, I appreciate the creative thinking about how to kind of like uh, stabilize 505 West Street. Um, that that would be great, especially if we end up having a wet spring. Um, and Beth, great great idea. Um, um, thank you for filling us in on the maintenance planning. And that seems like it will it will um, make a bundled NOI process way more efficient and not like duplicate efforts. So. Thank you. And that way it doesn't have to be like a rushed timeline um, or add more to what is clearly very, very full plates on, on all counts. All right. Um, so any other like concerns or comments? Um, and again, everyone, thank you, um, Guilford and Jason and Beth and Paul <laughs> um, for making the time to be here tonight. We really appreciate the open dialogue. And You're your welcome. Help with everything. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> and Bye. Beth, I'll, I'll bug you to learn more about that permit for the culverts <laughs> some other time. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, guys.
Okay, onward. Thank you, everyone. Um, should we do the minor administrative change from Eversource, Erin? Um, I see Kristen McDonough is on the call oh, for sorry. UMass. Um, yep. Maybe we could jump on that just while she's here. Great suggestion. Kristen, I'm going to bring you into the meeting. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, oh, yeah, this is the parking lot. It won't be a drive. Hi everyone. I'm Hi Kristen. Kristen. With SWCA, um, that was a perfect segue into what I'm here to discuss. So I'm here uh, to discuss UMass's bundled NOI. There is a five-year order of conditions for operation and maintenance that expires in 2023. Um, and right now UMass is looking to, oh sorry, 2024. Um, right now, UMass is looking to expand an existing gravel lot called Lot 13, which is just north of Olympia Drive. Um, and the there isn't a full uh, draft plan yet. There's just a concept plan, but the university anticipates that it will likely be within the 100 foot buffer zone to a jurisdictional bordering vegetated wetland. They're expecting it to be outside the 30 foot. Um, and under the orders of conditions and that DEP file number is 089-0647. Um, I think it's 14C, special condition 14C. Uh, minor buffer zone activities within the 100 foot buffer zone to a BBW, but outside the 30 foot can be approved by the wetland agent, but um, significant buffer zone work that is within the 100 foot buffer zone and outside the 30 foot buffer zone can be discussed by the commission. Um, to determine whether or not that would trigger a category three. And I can go into that in more detail, um, but I can also share the concept plan with you if you wanted to just take a peek at that. Okay. Yeah, before you share that, Kristen, Commissioner, so you guys under, uh, like clear on kind of what the delineation is in front of us, minor versus major activity within the 100 outside the 30. Um, so that's kind of what we have to figure out here. A quick, a quick summary would be useful. Um, there are some examples cited directly in the special conditions, but we can also look at the Wetlands Protection Act, Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, 10.02, which describes minor activities. Right, so in this case, they're asking for a, a parking area. Um, and I, I wouldn't say that a parking lot would qualify as a minor activity under the minor activities, um, you know, that are in the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, I think I wasn't here when this permit was passed. And I think there, as Kristen said, there are some specific examples that are cited um, in the uh, order of conditions, which, by the way, I think is in your um, OneDrive packets. At least I hope it is. Um, if not, I can pull those pull up the full order of conditions. Um, so that I also attached it to the letter dated February eighth. Um, oh yeah, which I believe is in the in the correspondence yeah. folder. Is it? Let me see. Should be. Um, but there, the examples that are given aren't really um, apples to apples per se with a uh, with a parking lot. So, and part of what is um, I guess difficult for me to navigate is um, when I started in February of 2019, UMass requested a parking lot on this, basically the same exact lot. Um, and um, that parking lot, <laughs> you know, I was just getting integrated into the functions of the Conservation Commission, and it was an expansion of an existing parking lot. And um, and so that was a project that moved forward under this permit. So just for transparency, there was a parking lot that is just, I want to say, west of this location where a parking lot was expanded. Um, 
this parking lot is a completely new parking lot. So in that case, the parking lot was expanded from existing parking lot into an area that was overgrown with like multi-floor rows. In this case, it's a existing forested area um, and it's on the east side of the same wetland. So if um, I'll make this shareable so Kristen, you can share a, a plan and we can see where those are. Um, so I think from my perspective, expansion of an existing parking lot where there wasn't a lot of clearing um, was a little less impactful per se than the proposed new parking lot which is in a completely forested location. I'm also a little bit oh, worried yeah. about sort of the cumulative impact of this because you get one parking area that's expanded um, and the area of expansion just kind of try to highlight it a little bit for you guys. So this was the existing um, parking area. It may have actually even been more over into here and it was expanded up in this area here. Right. Um, and so it was, and, and actually even over into this area. So I believe if that's correct. And then, um, so that was sort of the expansion of that existing parking and it's a gra it's a gravel area um, that was multi-floor rows this area is all forested and i could share with you guys a photo of what the forest looks like there just to give you a sense of it um, so it's kind of it's not really an apples to apples um, <clears throat> uh, consideration for me it's a it's a, like a little bit more impactful than what was already proposed and also sort of the cumulative impact of the two parking areas one on each side of the wetland is is a little bit um concerning to me just because i i'm not sure what the original intent of the um order of condition was in terms of activities that the commission considered to be minor if they were actually referencing the minor activities under the Wetland Protection Act, or if they, if members had more, um, you know, specific activities in mind that they thought should be acceptable. Yeah, so related but separate also, what is the status of the UMass enforcement order that's existing in terms um, of like what we have going on with UMass? So here's a quick update on that. Um, SWCA completed the wetland delineation before the end of the growing season. The engineers have not finished their limited land survey or um, engineering the culvert replacement. So we haven't we haven't moved forward with completing the NOI. We were hoping to get that done this winter so that we could start construction during low flow August. Mm -hmm. um, we're still hoping to hold on to that schedule, but we're waiting for engineers right now. Thanks, Kristen. Um, okay. So just Dave. to, oh, oh I see when Dave, Dave is done, I'll, I'll defer to Dave. Okay. Yeah, I guess my question is for Kristen, um, and I may not have caught all of this, but I was here through the entire, you know, um, period when UMass brought the plan, the O&M plan forward. So could you just, I guess, refresh my memory. So how is the building of this new lot, which really isn't connected, it's, it's really pretty much connected to a public way. How is that part of an O&M plan and not simply a new project? I'm, I, I might've missed that. Well, that's really what we're here to bring up to the commission. Um, I mean, there were some examples cited in the special conditions of what would be considered minor buffer zone work under this O&M, and that included, um, oh, hang on, I've got some cited somewhere. Um, well, significant was the convert. One of the examples cited for significant buffer zone work was the conversion of gravel lots to paved lots within the buffer zone. Um, I think I have some citations in the letter. So, and this italics is right out of the order. So, minor projects within the 30 foot.
Oh, maybe I put the examples in the email. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Well, again, you know, I think there's some logic when UMass some years ago was talking about, say, a gravel lot to a paved lot. Mm -hmm. As Aaron pointed out a couple of minutes ago, this is a fully forested hillside there north of Olympia Drive. So I'm, I guess I'm a little challenged to see how this would be conversion of anything. It's, it's, it's the construction of a new parking lot. And we'll, we're here to do whatever the commission recommends. We just, you know, and as you said earlier, Jen, as part of this bundled NOI and O&M, keeping the lines of communication open. Yeah. And Chris, Absolutely. is that yellow dash, that is that the 100 foot? Actually, I have lot. a what new delineation. So on this plan, Thank we're you. showing the 30 go. foot and the 50 foot, which under the revised bylaw would be required for the setback for a gravel parking lot. And then this is the 100 foot. This one's from Wood Woodard and Curran. And um, I don't know if I have a legend on this. So right. I a, think yeah. that is that has got to be the 30 foot because the plan was for it to be within the hundred and outside the 30. Yeah. So that's my guess. Yeah. That's pretty significant. And, and how, how many, how big is this parking lot? How many cars? Big boy. I don't have that answer. Um, I do know that there, this doesn't show any stormwater management associated with this, but there will be some stormwater associated with it. Eventually. This mm -hmm. is just an early concept. And just for reference that, so we did the math, we just did the Mather building, right? I'm just trying to, they're going to do new construction on that, aren't they? Yeah, there'll be a new. That's demolishing. Yeah, I'm just doing yeah. for, um, sorry, that was just for my uh, reference point there. Yeah, Aaron, I see, sorry guys, Aaron, I see your hand up. I just want to say quickly, Chris, and you know, based on my tenure and kind of the outlines of this project, I don't think this is minor, um, but I want to hear from the commission. My second comment is I'm pretty uncomfortable with an open enforcement order and no NOI submitted moving forward with more activity with UMass. That enforcement order is a pretty big deal. Um, and I think getting an NOI submitted on that is really important to this commission. I know that DEP is paying attention to the progress of that. Um, yeah. So that's, that's where my gut is going, but I'm interested to hear from everyone else. Aaron, did you have more info to add to that? You, you took the words right out of my mouth, yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but I um, just to, to add to that, I know Kristen said that they were hoping to get the NOI submitted this winter. The enforcement order, as I recall, required that they get the NOI submitted this winter. And it's frustrating to me that, you know, there's there's work being directed towards additional parking and additional projects when the enforcement um, response is stalled because of, you know, uh, a survey not being completed. Um, you know, as I, I'm just, I'm underscoring and putting an exclamation point behind what you just said that, that, that needs to get resolved and that w we, um, are very concerned that other projects are being put in front of or higher priority on in terms of getting them done before addressing the enforcement outstanding and we know you're just the messenger here Kristen of so course. let us know how to communicate this if um if necessary uh, Jen um, if I could, just one other point I wanted to make is is I yeah. do it does worry me a little bit the precedent of of this the potential precedent of this brand new parking lot in a essentially undisturbed forested area, you know, do I think it could be permitted? Sure, but I I, I really think it's, it's a separate per permitting process from the bundled NOI that we have with UMass, which was really for, you know, maintenance, routine maintenance. Yeah. And, and yeah, you know, the commission, you know, members of, of the commission allowed the parking lot to the west to happen, but that was for the most part, already a graveled parking lot anyway. So this just seems like a very different project. Um, I will say also that, you know, we do have a, the town has a very large residential development just to the east of this. And, you know, I, I just think, you know, those residents will deserve, you know, kind of a, a, a full 
open review of this pro of of this project. So um, okay. it, will, it will impact the neighborhood on Olympia Drive. Yeah. Um, I want to hear from commissioners. Uh, the other comment just quickly that I'll make is, is this within the um, Tanbrook catchment? Um, <clears throat> I no. think just it's outside. outside. It's outside. I might be yeah. just outside. Yeah. Okay. I think it's it's in the more northern, more okay. northerly watershed going in the opposite direction. Okay. Hollybrook is over there. Okay. Um, so just uh, just for reference, this just kind of off the page here is Tilson Farm. Yeah. And I don't okay. know if you remember the Tilson Farm permitting that happened several years ago. That was down by Hollybrook. So that's just kind of to the northeast. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Kristen. Yep. Um, all right, commissioners, any other, anything to add that we haven't already kind of established? I'm seeing I'm I, not I agree. I just, I just want to say I agree. We have an enforcement order that's open, so we should probably handle that first. And then this is definitely more than minor. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Cameron. Same here. And Andre. It seems like we're almost unanimous, Kristen, on okay. not a minor activity, and we need to see the permit filed for that open enforcement order. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Oh, Alex, I see you have your hand now, up. Just a quick question for Kristen. Uh, who would this serve? It would, would this parking lot serve the student dorm that's there now, the student housing that's there now, the residential community? Uh, obviously, UMass isn't going to build a parking lot for the residential community. I take that back. Uh, would it serve 47 Olympia Drive that's going to go up? Wh who parks there? Who would park there? From what I understand, this is associated with student parking. Generally speaking. Mm -hmm. Yes. I... So a commuter would come in, park his car, get on a bus, and go wherever he needs to go. That's... That's a theory. I, I mean, I know that there is there there are student buildings down here, and so this is an overfull parking lot, and this is an overfull parking lot, and so this is supplemental parking for those existing buildings. Yeah, wasn't there a protest there about the parking? And the students protested there was no parking. Oh, I don't know that. Okay, okay, this is all. <laughs> well, no, with there's no a need, need, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I just was just just background for me. I um. And it's interesting that it is where the water drains. And you said it would be gravel? Yes. How many gravel parking lots are there on UMass campus? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that lot 13 is all gravel. So this would be lot 13, and this is all lot 13, and this is all gravel. And I think a little bit behind Cold Storage Drive, and that's it. Oh, yeah, by Forestry Way. Yeah, back there, but... And they are gravel so that they allow infiltration? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think that we should, I think we've kind of signaled what we need to signal here and I wanna keep it moving. Um, any other questions, Kristen? Do you have a clear? Okay, I'm great. I'm good, um, just actually really quick. So just to clarify, it's the commission's it's the commission's opinion that we should have an NOI filed prior to a permit application for lot 13, yes. but not that that enforcement would necessarily be closed. Or that that uh, permit for the enforcement would be issued. I think, I think that that we just need to start getting the ball rolling on yeah. it. It, okay. it can't it. just sit on, uh, you know, unaddressed while we you know go ahead and permit another project right. yeah or at least review another project gotcha that's good to know thank you very much Aaron I, did you have I have one more question and I'm really sorry but this is just bothering me because it's on the plan Kristen in the um north west corner of that wetland it shows the wetland extending into the 30 foot um and I know as part of the oh we're here yeah, as part of the original approval, it was supposed to be at least 30 feet away. So I'm wondering, it looks like it's encroaching there. And if that's a, an error of some sort, I have to look back at the original plan that was approved, but I just wanted to flag that. And the other comment I did want to just make was <clears throat> Kristen had indicated to me that 
that that area, and I didn't know this previously, but this area is a potential, potentially a vernal pool. So that was something that wasn't disclosed when the other original parking lot or the per parking lot expansion was approved. And so just to flag that for commissioners, because we have a hundred foot no disturb around vernal pools. And I was just disappointed that we didn't know about that before that other one was permitted, but it's kind of water over the bridge at this point. It's not listed as a potential vernal pool on the Natural Heritage website. It just, when I went out there and did the delineation, it looked like it could be, I mean, this is winter. So this is from the Eastern end looking West. And just to flash back to that plan, um, it's like maybe, maybe it's this little pocket right here. So I'm standing okay. here facing West. Okay. Um, so I don't think that would even really affect okay. over here. Cause this is okay. all, and I have other photos showing what the rest of that BVW looks like. It's a really transitional wetland. It's it's actually a pretty tricky delineation because it's just so transitional and there's so much non-native species out there. There's a lot of buckthorn and it's okay. immersed. So you can imagine what that looks like. Um, well, I appreciate you clarifying the location of it because I thought for some reason it was further west. So that yeah. makes me feel better anyways. And this and this concept does have an outdated, I think this is the DEP layer and this, yeah. is, this is the newer wetland. So, you know, this doesn't show the rest, the west side of it because we didn't refresh the west side, but um, you know the the wetter pool is right north of A twelve, so it's this wet spot right here, for for context. And this, for some reason, doesn't connect. Um, I could not find a culvert that goes between here and this island wetland in here, mm. despite a couple different delineations, never found a culvert. So we'll get back in front of you with um, a permit application for this and we will see you soon for the uh, forestry way NOI. And if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to give us a call and here to answer questions anytime. Okay, thanks, Kristen. Thank thanks you. all. Thank you for have being the middle person. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again, I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Good night. Have a good night. All right. Um, oh boy. Okay. We still have Tofino and 979. Um, yeah. So Tofino, we're kind of not going to vote on tonight. Okay. Um, yeah. I talked you to didn't Ted. go out. Today. Yeah. I wasn't okay. able to get out there and I talked to Ted Parker. Um, there was some last minute information that Chris Brestrup and Jason Skeels made me aware of um, about some outstanding. I just want to get a little more information on. Um, okay. And then, but the, but the overall goal of this is to close out the existing order of water. conditions and get a new one um, so that we're not working with a 2004 order of conditions. So I'm going to continue striving towards that goal and yeah. hopefully at the next meeting, we'll get that to you. Okay. Okay, so yeah, commissioners, just to summarize or restate what Aaron just said. So Tofino is up in Air in Amherst Woods. There's like basically the stormwater infrastructure, but not there's like still an outstanding road that has to be built. And the re the initial permit for like a bunch of buildings and lots up there was issued in 2004. So what we'd like to do is close out the certificate of compliance for that. 2004 effort and have a new order of conditions for actually putting in that road. But in order to do that well, um, Aaron wants to get some clarity on kind of what exists out there, how it's being maintained, and like kind of get the intel she needs in order to have that order of conditions ready for discussion. Um, so it just makes the most sense to wait until Aaron has a chance to collect all of that info before we formalize that discussion. So that's the update on that one. Eversource, minor administrative change, Aaron? Yes. So um, at the last meeting, we approved a um, replacement electrical service for 797 Southeast Street, an underground cable replacement that services a single family home. They, everything was approved um, as far as what had been originally um, proposed. They had come before the board, um, as you probably all recall, with um, s proposed use of rubber matting for um, basically as a BMP 
to protect the wetland during construction for the construction equipment so that the wetland wasn't damaged or compacted by the equipment during the construction because the wetland is very tight on either side of the driveway. As they were, um, they're approaching um, basically moving forward with the replacement because it's faulting out and there's a lot of problems there. They were concerned um, that they didn't include enough of the temporary matting. Um, and so they wanted to account for more just in case the um, vehicle access um, with equipment was there was a potential for greater impact. They wanted to put more matting down just to be prepared for that. So I see this as a very good thing. Like, a, um, you know, it would be a, a temporary impact of the mats being placed. Um, I've seen these mats used many times. They prevent compaction of the wetland. They're a very temporary measure and it prevents the wetland from getting completely chewed up and um, uh, disturbed during the uh, equipment access. So they're just checking with us to see it was an increase from 15 square feet to 90 square feet, not a tremendously huge area and basically just wanted to check with the commission that you guys were good with that before I issue the order of conditions. <laughs> Two thumbs up. Thank okay. you Eversource for the communication. Right. I think that is belt and suspenders. Yeah. <laughs> We are in good shape. Okay. <laughs> That's all I was looking for. <laughs> Moving right along. Great. Um, okay. I think that was it for our agenda. Unless yes. there's anything I didn't know about Aaron. Nope. That's everything. All right. Thanks, right, everyone. Man. This was a, I know this was a lot to hey, get good through. Job. Nice um, job, Jen. Yeah. I appreciate everyone's attention. Um, yeah. I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> Eight thirty nine. I think Cameron got it. Yeah. Nice. All right. Voice vote. Cameron. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. Am I? I'm an I. Unanimous. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Awesome. Good job, Talk guys. To you guys soon. Thank Take you, care, everyone. Have a good night.